From ghoulies and ghosties. From ghoulies and ghosties. And long-leggedy beasties. And long-leggedy beasties. And things that go bump in the night. Good Lord! Deliver us. Deliver us. and spool cats thank you so much for joining us this evening of course i am count rahun and this is my feature of fright we have a, a very special guest this evening um he is uh what i have deemed this evening to be the maniacal maestro of the last drive-in with joe bob briggs uh he is also a a, a trauma alum uh, he uh, was actually at one time the assistant to Lloyd Kaufman, and uh, he, uh, he made a, a few independent films through Troma, and we're going to talk more about that. We're also going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about his music, and uh, we're also going to ask him about his rigatoni. So without further ado, <laughs> new, um, my, my newest friend, Mr. John Brennan. John, welcome to Count Rahun's Feature of Fright. Thank you, Count. This is the first time I've ever actually spoken to a real Count. So uh, this is really exciting for me. And uh, I'm a big fan of all things um, spooky and vampirish. So uh, this is great. I love it. Well, I hope I live up to the hype. <laughs> you do? I mean, look, you got a, a Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein uh, poster right behind you. So any friend of that uh, film is a friend of mine. Oh, sure. crap. I, I couldn't ask for more. Um, now, just for clarification, uh, do you have do you have any relation to or are you, in fact, a clone of the former CIA director of the same name? <laughs> so uh, this has come up a lot, actually, over the course of the last, I don't know, eight to you know, 10 years, whatever he uh, started uh, taking over the CIA. And I like to tell people he was the head of the central intelligence agency and I was the head of the cookie Institute of America. So I can see where people get a little confused because he's into, <laughs> <laughs> he's into information. I'm into cookies. Um, he's John O Brennan. I don't know what the O stands for. Uh, but I'm John Patrick Brennan. So there's a little, there's slight differences. I also, uh, you know, I don't know anything about the, the conspiracy theories or any of that other than what I read on the internet. So, <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the the cookie agency uh, ha has done a lot of good for humanity. So oh, we, we appreciate your service. <laughs> you know, just the Keebler elves, man. They, they, they were doing a lot of good stuff for people back in the 80s. Uh, other than obesity, they were just, you know, giving kids treats. And it was a delicious time for, the, for America. So, yes, we try to keep that as we go, the Cookie Institute of America. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, there's other John Brennans out there, too. Um, there's this guy, John Wolf Brennan who somehow I am uh, linked to forever now because anytime that I upload music to YouTube automatically through something like DistroKid, I get put on his page. So <laughs> <laughs> any of my music that streams uh, just under the name John Brennan goes to his YouTube page. So I, I don't mind. It, it, so just out of curiosity, did you happen to look him up to see if he was a musician or is it, is it one did. of those things where like you are a, a producer and a musician and then he just happens to be a chess master. No, I wish that was the case because that would be a little more, uh, it would be easy to tell us apart. Um, no, he's actually a musician. He's pretty good. He does like blues, rock and roll. And I was thinking about uh, reaching out to him one day and saying, look, we're, we're collaborating anyway, whether we like it or not with this name. So let's, uh, let's do something together. So that might be coming. The John Brennan versus John Brennan uh, EP. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I love, I, I, I can imagine the hype going into it because it's almost like a, it's like Undertaker versus Undertaker, 
but uh, a lot more pleasant and more musically inclined. So yes, but but I I I, I would I would love to see the graphics for that one. So he also has it. <laughs> he also has Wolf in his name. So as uh, horror uh, lovers, we like that very much. There you go. He could be a werewolf, and then you could we could have you like the Frankenstein monster. So we could do like a a, a really cold uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman rehash i love it i also have uh wanted to play the creature from the brown lagoon Ooh. uh at some point so is that, we'll, an, we'll... Is that an unofficial uh spin-off of hashtag shakespeare shitstorm uh, it should be it should be <laughs> i you know anything uh that has to do with brown has to do with uh shakespeare shitstorm because uh, if <laughs> you've seen the movie it's canon now <laughs> it's canon <laughs> well that's uh funny that you should mention that because the behind the scenes for Shakespeare's hashtag Shakespeare since shitstorm is titled "Brown is the warmest color," so oh. that's coming. That's coming, and it's uh -huh. about it's it's about an hour and fifty minutes five zero, and uh, it's going to be great. It's 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 almost as good. That's why we're starting to try and just tighten it up as the other ones, like the Poultry in Motion one that was for Poultry Guys or Apocalypse Soon for Citizens Oxy. It's got a lot of great stuff in there. And so it, it, sooner or later, it will make its way to Truman Now. It's, it's Truman Now or um, uh, Blu-ray, which we're working on for probably the end of the year, closer to uh, Black Friday or Christmas. We'll have a hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm Blu-ray, hopefully, fingers crossed. Excellent. Well, I hope so. Uh, so we, we um, I, I had the honor to uh, present hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm uh, here in Nashville. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's a, um, <laughs> I really enjoyed the film. Um, I do, I didn't know if, uh, if you felt the same way, but uh, even, this, this movie seemed to cross so many lines, even for Lloyd's standards, <laughs> which is what makes it fantastic. <laughs> well, Lloyd uh, has said a few times that this might be his last movie, so he wanted to do uh, as extreme as possibly as he possibly could, and I think he's, he nailed it, and on top of that, he threw in a few intellectual jabs as well. Yes, uh, it's a be uh, an interesting um, um, melting pot, as it were, uh, with uh, with trauma and the mind of Lloyd Kaufman. Or a melting poop. Or a melting poop. Yes, of course. We have to keep the poop analogy going. <laughs> How rude of me! <laughs> so shifting gears just a little bit, let, let's put the focus back on you, uh, Signore Brennan. Sure. Uh, so. Do you consider yourself a, a filmmaker who plays music or a musician who likes to make movies or none of the above? Because why label anything? I kind of agree with the last one, um, because it's it, it, if something comes along to me where I feel like I can do it and it might help me and, and, and you know, either financially or creatively or just uh, in my brain, you know, th therapeutically. I'll do it. You know, if, if all of a sudden somebody offers me a gig as a banker and uh, it turns out that I have the time to do it and I seem to have a knack for it, I would do it. But uh, as far as right now, I am leaning more towards the music stuff only because it's so much more easy for me to do as either a singular person or maybe just at most four or five people collaborating. Mm -hmm. When you start to get into movies, it's so hard. Um, even on the lowest level, I mean, even if you're making a $10,000 movie, you need a bunch of people, at least a dozen people to help you out, whether it's in pre-production, production or post-production. So um, I'm starting to find that, yes, movies are more of a special thing. Uh, th there are things that I would like to do, uh, you know, as I continue on in this career, but I'm starting to shift towards more goal-oriented things with music. Mm -hmm. So always a, a, a musician at heart. Yes. So with that being said about your music, uh, let's have a little exercise. Let's sure. say I'm a chud and, uh, <laughs> and I want to hear some of your music. Absolutely. How do you describe your style? Um, I would say it's a genre hopping music because I uh, one of my favorite bands is the band Ween. And uh, when I was introduced to them, uh, they opened me up uh, as far as because I was writing a lot of songs anyway uh, at the time and I had written some Irish drinking songs and then I had written some love songs that were real but I also had written some comedy songs and vulgarity you know it was all over the map when I got into Ween I said this is exactly what I've been doing and this is how I want to continue to do it because why limit yourself uh, to a genre I never understood that uh, I never understood people who were like I can't stand country music 
no, no, no. You just can't stand some country music. There's mu- there's country music out there that will absolutely speak to you. Mm-hmm. So um, I've always come from the standpoint of experiment and genre because you never know how the experiment might turn out. It might be better than the stuff that I'd already been doing. So uh, I would say, long story short, genre hopping. Genre hopping. I, I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, a quick question about your handle, uh, Bad Techno. Yeah. Where does the name come from? So uh, it actually derives from a song that I had written maybe in high school. Uh, probably, yeah, probably uh, I was a senior in high school and I wrote this song at the time. I had gone to some of the clubs in New York City, like Exit or Tunnel, uh, Limelight, and I had, you know, participated in a little bit of the MDMA and, uh, you know, had a little bit of fun. And I met some people that were on that club scene, and there seemed to be these stereotypical people that were uh, clones of each other. I may have just been on a lot of drugs, but this is how I saw it. So I wrote this song because also at the time, some of the techno was really good. And some of the techno was just god awful. I'm talking the worst. And um, but again, I, I found things that I, I liked in it. There's that one that's like uh, Zombie Nation is like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that's a great fucking song. But then you have other shit that sucks. So um, I wrote this song called Bad Techno, and it's like a snapshot of different characters who are stereotypes that were in that scene. So one's a Guido, one's a cheerleader. One's a hippie, there's a drag queen, and they basically all sing about their experiences at the club and that they love bad techno. So then when I got into social media, I just liked the name bad techno. So that was my first Twitter handle. And then I just kept it ever since. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and you can find, I also, yeah. I, oh, I see here in your coffin. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. No, of at bad techno and bad techno.com, bad techno.com. Uh, it's an old website that I just, it's like, so it's, oh, it's probably 12, 15 years old and I never updated it. I just love the like old aesthetic of it. Uh, so I left it up there and you can find portals on it to my newer stuff, but I like to keep it there and just like, you know, let it, let it be as it is. No. And, and that's wonderful. We, we appreciate, we very clearly appreciate nostalgia uh, in yes. our world for sure. Yes. Um, so you seem like a very worldly man, uh, Mr. Brennan. <laughs> and the reason I say this is because I, I, I want you to uh, sort of help me with this uh, conundrum that I have found myself in. So, okay. well, first of all, would, would you, would, is it safe to say that there is a fair use of synthesizer in techno music? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so with that thought, do you have a friend who just swears up and down that they hate 80s music and they hate synthesizer. And yet for whatever reason, their top out, like maybe five or six out of their top 10 favorite songs are all from the 80s and are very heavy on synthesizer. <laughs> well, I don't have a specific friend like that um, who has that. Because I think too niche. <laughs> <laughs> it, niche or specific, I don't know uh, if, you're, if you're talking about a very, very specific person, but. I know people like that who uh, sort of will uh, denigrate a whole genre, like I said, country or something, and then suddenly uh, they, they come around. So that, that I think that you could convince this person. I mean, if they're, they're saying that the 80s suck, but five of their favorite songs are 80s songs, they've obviously oh, the jumped the hurdle, uh, jumped the shark. <laughs> <laughs> and sin. See, now, what I don't understand... Um, there's people who want to say that uh, stuff like metal should be pure without synths and things like that. I disagree. I think that there's some really, even more so sometimes than a guitar, evil sounding things that a synth can do. Mm. Uh, low rumbles or or just like, pu- like they puke out these sounds that would never be, na- they're not natural. So I feel like it's the synthesizer, if you use it in an orchestrated way where it's uh, mixed in and, 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 and sort of... Uh, it, like so for instance metal and makes it more evil mm. i think that it's 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 a great tool and i think that sometimes somebody who's so uh pure will miss opportunity especially an artist um shouldn't shouldn't exclude anything like a synthesizer missing uh, the forest for the trees as yeah true. there you go you know like like <laughs> how could somebody say that uh the entire genre of hip-hop is not worth it i mean it's it's of course it's worth it it's like the it, we've watched it grow 
uh, from this uh, street thing into this, the, the probably the biggest music on the planet right now. So I don't know. It's just like, and it's been amazing to watch that happen sort of in my lifetime. Um, I hope that I can't wait for the next thing, you know? And in, my lifetime, and in my yeah. lifetime, watching <laughs> the evolution from, um, from sticks to hot yeah. chords to, uh, to beats, it's yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah, but have you ever met who, who are some of the dead celebrities you've interacted with? You know, Bach. I I've I've gotten that question quite a bit. Yeah. Not not as many as you would think. Okay. However, um, I was best friends with Attila the Hun in high school. <laughs> um, and let's see, I accidentally met Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington on the same day by chance, and. Um, well, technically, I met Joe Bob Briggs. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Most Actually, yeah. of them, most of them, you could find at your typical Saturday night blood orgy. So it, it's it, there's a through line there. It only makes sense, exactly. And of course, <laughs> uh, uh, if 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 we're, if we're if we're gonna be in the habit of name dropping, uh, Lloyd uh, Lloyd has actually been on the show a couple of times as well. So awesome. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. So speaking of Joe Bob, you are the, the maestro, forgive me, the maniacal maestro uh, <laughs> that has brought us the theme song for The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, as well as the other great musical numbers that we've had uh, the, pri the, pri the privilege of witnessing uh, over, the, uh, over the, uh, the four seasons uh, that we have, uh, th that Last Drive-In has, has gone on so far. Uh, and you are also one of the purveyors of one of my favorite chants of all time, Hogzilla. Hogzilla, 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 Hogzilla. I know you probably get asked to do that about a billion times a day. but And I love every single time. I, I, I just, I'm so grateful for Joe Bob Briggs giving me something that I'll probably be uh, chanting and... Uh, and, and performing for the rest of my creative career. So uh, uh, people wait their whole lives to get something like that. I'll be the Hogzilla guy. I love it. It brings me so much joy. It never yeah. gets old. <laughs> yeah, it never does. It, it, even like, so at the Jamboree the, uh, last year, we had really nothing to do with Hogzilla, but every so often there would just be a Hogzilla chant that busted out and it brings everybody so much joy. So it, it like, uh, like uh, chanting woo in a, in a wrestling arena. Sure, yeah. <laughs> or, or that old Orsinio Hall's whoop, 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 yes. you know, that shit. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. I love it. I even, uh, I've even started to uh, sign pictures when I don't know what to, when somebody doesn't want anything specific. I just oh, say Hogzilla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have rewatched that episode, I want to say at least two or three times. It's um, great. I, I, I love that episode. I love the film. I, <laughs> I, I, would, I would definitely go and see Hogzilla too. If there is going to be a hug. Uh, honestly, there's been so uh, the other uh, I think actually the premiere, the Night of the Living Dead. Um, I, I uh, took over the mutant family Twitter account, mutantfam.com. And uh, I asked for pitches for uh, Hogzilla sequels. And there were a lot of great ideas, <laughs> uh, even going so far as like the guy who wrote the original um, uh, uh, Doctor Strange. He, he even put in a pitch called The Baconing. So there's so many people out there who, from the top to the bottom, who want this Hogzilla sequel. So I think that there's something there. And I, within the next decade, we might see something. We've got to make this happen. Yeah. Hogzilla in space, Hogzilla at the Earth's core, Hogzilla oh, versus Hogzilla. There's so many things. What if we tried to get permission from Toho to do Godzilla versus Hogzilla? Oh, man. I mean, Hogzilla. <laughs> or is that and, going too far? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think uh, a Hogzilla Kaiju isn't out of the realm of possibility. That would be incredible. That would be. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, um, I preempted with all of that to ask simply, you know, how did your journey with The Last Drive-In begin? Uh, it's it's the, the origin, like the, old, the oldest part of the origin actually begins with trauma because um, I met Justin Martell and Matt Mangerides, who are the executive producers of The Last Drive-In, I met them many years before because they had worked at Troma. And then when I came to Troma, they were sort of on their, their way of leaving and starting their own company. But we always stayed in touch. And uh, through that, um, they asked me when they were reviving Joe Bob's show, if I would take a stab at a demo for a theme song. And um, I just 
you know, I, I loved Monster Vision when I was younger, and I even watched uh, Joe Bob's Drive-In Theater on the, the movie channel when I was really young uh, at sleepovers and stuff with my cousin. So I was like, yes, I'll do it. And so I did it, and it just it happened really fast. So now it's the theme song, and I got to say, I, it's brought me so much joy, and, and the fact that people – uh, put videos of themselves singing it or showing their kids dancing to it. It's just like, I, I can't believe that it, it's actually reached that many people mm -hmm. because I was always just like a home recording sort of doing it just for myself as a therapeutic exercise and a creative exercise. I never really thought of music as an actual career choice, but that's what this has brought to me. So yeah, if the origins were trauma and then the rest just sort of ballooned out. Ballooned out, you did the theme song, and then of course you've done, um, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm not using the correct terminology here, but uh, uh, the, the music parodies that we've seen in different sure. episodes, like you did with Black Roses, uh, with Prom Night 2, and, and, you know, and even more, um, and then the, uh, the Spookies rap, of course. Yes, so that's a good way to, I, th I think that that's a good way to say it, is a, a they're basically like genre parodies where mm -hmm. we're not parodying exact songs by like changing the lyrics or something like a Weird Al would do. We're taking the style and then creating our own original version of what that style would be. So uh, you mentioned um, the Black Roses episode. What made that song, which is called Stick, uh, Stick Shift Drive in Love, what made that authentic to me is that Ace Von Johnson from the LA Guns actually contributed and co-wrote the music with me. Oh, wow. So, and he's a real guy like that. I mean, mm -hmm. LA Guns, when I was a kid, they were huge. Mm -hmm. um, so getting him to add the authenticity of, of the style makes it, it makes it uh, to me less comedy and more just a, a, uh, a tribute to what that style is. Same thing with Spookies. That was like my version of what Cypress Hill would do. <laughs> as an end credit theme song to Spookies. So I take, you know, my inspirations and things like that and sort of pour them into what we do on the last drive-in. So uh, to that end, I, I did want to sort of explore uh, your write, your songwriting process. Sure. Um, and, and specifically with, um, with the last drive-in, because like I was always curious, you know, do you know the movies in advance? You know, do you have to kind of come up with it on the fly or do you have sort of a maybe it's sort of a collaborative process with joe bob or he or, or the the production team is like hey this is the movie we're going to do uh which one you know what, what song do you want to write sure uh it happens both ways so for instance um one that was a spontaneous instance was the madman mars theme song from the madman episode oh. uh it, we hadn't planned on performing that at all and then I think Justin Martell suggested we should get, because I had an acoustic guitar because we had something else planned for another episode. And Justin suggested, John has his guitar. Why don't Joe Bob and John sing the Mad Man theme song? So I went off, I learned it for 10 minutes and we did it and we got it in one take. So that was like a very spontaneous, interesting way that that um, came uh, sort of just uh, generically out of the set and ideas just spewing forth. But then there's other things like spooky things, um, spooky's thing where way in advance, Austin said, what would you like to do this season? And I said, I would like to attempt a hip hop song. And he said, well, that's great because we have this movie Spookies that we're doing and we could like put Maniac Cop 2 the week before and they have a great ending rap song. And then, so then we'll do our own the weekend after. And so it just like, it came out of me saying, I just wanted to do a hip hop song. Perfect. Yeah, so, and then the, each song has like kind of its own backstory. So um, it's sort of a, a a great collaborative process a lot and a lot of it starts with austin jennings and joe bob when they're sort of writing and researching these movies so uh, building on from that from there <clears throat> excuse me so we've got sort of an essence of what the songwriting process looks like i want to know a little bit more about what it looks like uh on a a broadcast or a stream day for the last drive in because you sort of mentioned earlier you wear a lot of hats is, yeah. is that safe to say sure absolutely i i've done everything just like at trauma trauma prepared me uh for doing everything from scrubbing the toilets to producing the movies and uh much like that mentality that i kept with trauma i brought over into the last drive-in where i i drive trucks i'll clean the bathrooms i'll i do the catering i do the craft services i'll do anything that they throw at me 
just mm-hmm. because I, I, I want to help the show and I love, uh, I love what the show represents. And uh, yeah, and then I get to do like the icing on top, which is the couple of times I get to act, I get to do the music. So it's a great payoff. Hopefully a little less messy than hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm. <laughs> Sometimes we did have a couple of blood days uh, here and there. You know, there was some, uh, some, some cleanup that had to be done on the last drive-in, but not, yeah, nothing as major as the shitstorm sequence. That was absolutely the most horrific cleanup in movie cinema history. <laughs> Well, if you don't mind, I actually kind of want to go back uh, okay. to, to way, way back to, to talk a little bit more about the trauma days. Sure. Um, so I, if you could, so were you sort of involved with trauma before uh, you were uh, uh, Lloyd's assistant? Um, and if yeah. so, like what were, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, you, um, you made several projects under trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and you went officially under uh, John P. Brennan. Uh, I believe you did uh, a couple of uh, Sergeant Kabuki Man corners, uh, the co- Kabuki Man's Cocktail Corner, yeah, and, uh, and a few other things. So I just kind of want to pick your brain about it and see, just uh, just talk more about the uh, the early days. As sure. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why it was John P. Brennan. I, I think the only reason why is because there were so many John Brennans. There was like 40 of them on... Um, on imdb so i said let me be john p brennan but then i said i don't even go by that so why don't i just do my full name john patrick brennan and then if people want to find me they can whatever it's, and now it's, it's just bubba <laughs> yeah now johnny bubba and you know why is because the iron sheik dubbed me that i i found a a, a license plate that said uh jabroni and I, <laughs> I i i sent it to the iron sheik and i said is this hulk hogan's car and he retweeted and answered back yes johnny bubba this is the whole Hogan's <laughs> car. So I mean, I'm Johnny Bubba now. If the if the Iron Sheik calls you that, it's it sticks for life. So um, I'm very happy to have that, and I, I maybe will one day change my <laughs> IMDb to reflect that. Um, but as far as what what happens with trauma, it, again, it's like a Twitter thing where Lloyd Kaufman was um, saying, "Oh, if you uh, want to be a volunteer here at Trauma, we're looking for editing volunteers." And at the time. I had sort of gotten all right at editing and did some music videos and a few like infomercials and stuff like that. So I applied and I got the gig and I was doing for a while, make your own damn movie lessons for YouTube. And Mm -hmm. that got me collaborating with Lloyd and he liked the collaboration. He kept asking me to do certain things. And uh, then I got a few other gigs like um, this was amazing. I got to do a feature length compilation called Troma's Horror Boobs, which Mm -hmm. is a compilation of the very breast of trauma, which are scenes where they have breasts, but also horror. Mm -hmm. So I basically directed and wrote that compilation uh, and uh, collaborated with a guy, Matt Desiderio, who was the inventor of horror boobs. Uh, Matt Matt was a guest on this show uh, many years ago, actually. That's amazing. He's great. He's, He's a very learned, uh, mm-hmm. guy as far as like shot on video stuff and a cult and obscure uh, cinema he at one time I went and saw him and he basically I was said pick out uh, any I'll buy whatever you suggest and he mm-hmm. got me a stack of DVDs and blu-rays and I, I've, I've been watching them ever since so he's he's a great guy um but that so horror boobs came about and I was still like volunteering for trauma so I got this major project and I was I would have been satisfied with just that um, but then what happened was Lloyd's assistant, at the time was leaving for sudden reasons. I don't know why he just was, he couldn't work the next week. And so Lloyd called me and said, uh, would you like to be my assistant? Um, on top of that, uh, it will be, a, not only will you be my assistant, you could also produce projects and things for the company and it'll be a great collaboration. So when he said that it was going to be a collaboration, I, I jumped at the chance because um, he's, it's Lloyd Kaufman. So if I could learn from the inside uh, how to make movies this guy's been doing it at the time he was doing it 42 years or something like that and Mm -hmm. now he's close to 50 i believe um i I jumped at the chance so that's when i developed kabuki man's cocktail corner for the youtube channel and we did a ton of episodes i mean we did 16 episodes plus a feet uh, an hour-long special for trauma now kabuki man's cocktail corner loaded in las vegas Mm -hmm. um and there's some uh, unedited episodes maybe about 10 that I'm planning on releasing much later. I mean, like I'm talking when we're like 70 years old 
and it'll be a reflection on <laughs> on uh, <laughs> our time at Troma. Um, so then moving on from the Kabuki Man stuff, I started to do other shorts. Uh, the Dolphin Man series I did, Dolphin Man Battles Sex Lobsters, which was actually kind of a festival hit. It, it circulated on six continents and 33 international film festivals. So I uh, wasn't really, because there was a lull between movies. Uh, Lloyd had just finished Return to Newcomb High Volume 1. I helped him finish Return to Newcomb High Volume 2. And then there was like a long time where he was thinking about what his next project would be before he happened upon Shakespeare's Shitstorm. So while that time was happening, I was just like, all right, I'll do, uh, you know, intros and uh, shorts and all this sort of stuff, music videos, whatever I can get my hands on that's not a feature film, just because I didn't have the time to do a feature. And then when Shakespeare's Shitstorm came along, I stepped out of the assistance position and went to the full time producer position. So speaking of, you're, you're a great guest because you, you, you just you perfectly segue into exactly the next point. It's almost <laughs> like you're reading my mind, which I wouldn't doubt. Well, the creature from the Brown Lagoon has psychic abilities, so. There you go, okay, so <laughs> that's, you heard it first. So the, the John Brennan has telep telepathic abilities, so wonderful. So uh, that segues perfectly into, since as your role as the producer, I, I'm curious to see um, in that capacity, do you have uh, other projects that you're working on uh, outside of The Last Drive-In? Yes, Maybe well- Maybe outside of Troma. Absolutely, There's, I'm always uh, developing something that I wanna make for myself. Now, the problem is, like I said earlier, uh, it's, it's so, difficult to make a movie. I mean, it's, it's really hard and, and it's, it's a huge commitment. Mm -hmm. So I've sort of, uh, for the last year or so, I've been writing a bunch of stuff and I have six or seven projects in various levels of budgets that I could do. Like I have my $25,000 movie. I have my hundred thousand dollar movie. I have my million dollar movie. I have my movie that who cares what it costs, get Tom Cruise on the line, you know? <laughs> so, um, I've been developing all these projects because I feel like, uh, you know, the last drive-in, I believe, will last for a, a, a while yet. I hope, hopefully, we have three or four more seasons. Um, but after that, I, I hope to parlay into uh, some sort of a career where I could shoot a couple of these things. Um, as far as right now, though, I'm probably going to focus on more short things because in between the last drive-in plus the music projects that I have, that that's probably what I'm going to be concentrating on 2020. What is it, 2022? <laughs> yes, it's all running together. I yeah, still, sometimes so, I still think it's 2020. <laughs> exactly. So 2022, 2023, I have a couple of major um, uh, music projects that I want to do. One of them is called The Last drive Through, which is tangentially related to uh, the show. But it would be basically John Brennan and the Big Feet doing songs about food, cars, heavy metal, and, uh, you know, maybe a, a cameo or two from Joe Bob and uh, Darcy. But not show related just songs that are st stay on their own um so that will be a major thing and then a, a couple of things coming up but uh to answer your other question yes i ultimately hope to at least make one or two movies that i get to write and direct because i feel like i've been developing these things for so long and and almost um gratefully uh that i'm able to make them better as time goes on because i learn new things. I get more life experience. I see other projects that inspire me. So I feel like once I get these um, things to the right people who finance a uh, million dollar movies, it will be a pretty interesting project. It'll be funny, uh, gory, scary. It'll be all the things. All the things that we love. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And mutants. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned your uh, your your band uh, just a second ago, uh, John Brennan and and the Bigfoots. Um, I said that correctly, right? <laughs> the Big Feet. The Big Feet. I'm sorry. <laughs> so John Brennan and the Big Feet. Um, yeah. Did I? Uh, I I've, I want to say that I saw on social media that uh, are you are you guys you guys were either in the studio or you've mm -hmm. got a, a bit, you got, you got a round of gigs coming up. So yes. One of the major things that we're doing this summer is uh, the second iteration of Joe Bob's Jamboree, which is happening in Memphis mm -hmm. um, on uh, July 8th and 9th and 10th. Mm -hmm. We'll be playing two sets of music, one on Friday and one on Saturday. The set on Friday will be sort of consisting of 
uh, songs from Memphis, you know, rock and roll. We got the blue suede shoes, all that sort of stuff. And we're going to go deep and heavy. And uh, I mean, my band is so good. We got Levi White, who's one of the most underrated uh, guitar players, I think, in, in the history of the world. The guys like Dean Ween or, or uh, Trey Anastasia or something. Uh, and then we got one of the greatest, uh, just like hold it down drummers, Jimmy Adamson. This guy's been doing punk shows since uh, the 90s and uh, he, can, he can make you dance or he can make you mosh. And then we have Joe um, Shack on bass and somebody once described his playing as uh, he plays the bass like a fiddle because he could walk, he could walk mm -hmm. that bass, he could uh, hammer on that bass or he could, you know, funk the bass. So um, we've been getting pretty tight and that picture that you mentioned was in uh, Pirate Studios. So we've been rehearsing all that stuff for uh, Joe Bob's Jamboree. And then we have a few ideas for shows uh, coming up. Nice. So if you're in the Memphis area, which is yeah. not terribly far from here, make sure you head, head, make your way out to Joe Bob's Jamboree to watch this because this is, uh, this is, this is quite the show. I'm, it's I'm going to be great. And then we have a couple of uh, things we haven't announced yet. A couple of other guests who people will be quite pleased. Okay. <laughs> yeah, quite pleased. I mean, they've already announced uh, so many great people are going to be there. Felissa Rose, Fred Williams, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so many people, a bunch of the, the AEW wrestlers, Jonah Ray from uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. It's a great uh, lineup of, of, of guests. And then on top of that, the Friday night, they're showing Halloween three with a lot of the cast in attendance, Tom Atkins. Oh boy. It's, it's <laughs> going to be sick. <laughs> no, it, it, it sounds impressive. Um, and like I said, spooks and spook gets make your way out there. You said July 8th through the 10th. Yes. Uh, yeah. In, in the Memphis area. So that's great. He's um, Joe Bob's been coming back and forth to Tennessee quite a bit. It feels like he was here uh, about a month ago for a uh, full moon. He was, he, he was actually just here this past weekend in Knoxville for Frankencon. And he's coming back, uh, I, I guess, at least one more time over the summer. So that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, and on top of it, besides just the music and stuff, uh, Sunday is going to be a full-blown Mutant Fest uh, film festival. Uh, so I, I think that the, I think there's still, uh, submissions are still open. They, it may have closed today if it's the, um, I'm not 100% sure, I have to look at that, but hopefully people submitted their great work and uh, it'll be shown at an awesome drive-in. My, uh, my uh, friend of the show, Jeff Wedding, uh, his film, uh, Tennessee Gothic, um, one for, uh, oh, won yeah. the big award last that year. That was last so. year, it was great, great movie and it's it right is. up it's Joe Bob's alley. Movie. Yeah. Fantastic movie. Yeah. So, and that, and you could be next. You could be yeah. next, anybody. <laughs> Short and and features. Send them. So I know that you can't say much because of those pesky NDAs, but <laughs> just how lame would we be if we missed uh, the rest of the season of the last driving of Joe Bob? Games? Oh man, this season is so. I mean, already just look at what uh, we've got in the last three weeks. Movies that wouldn't necessarily. Um, you know, make you think, oh, I want to see that immediately, right? You know, whatever. But then you get something like Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, which I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind. It was such a good film. I mean, Jodie Foster and Martin Sheen are incredible. The whole cast is incredible. Um, and then you get stuff like classics with, with Sven Gulli with The Night of the Living Dead. I mean, come on. That, I, I, that was, I was so giddy about that. Uh, Death by Temptation. Mm -hmm. who, who uh, you know, the, introducing such a, a brand, a new audience to Death by Temptation, which is a great movie. It's a great mm -hmm. 90s uh, independent film. It is. So from here on in, I mean, the movies just keep getting more and more interesting. And um, you're going to have everything from uh, absolute classics to the down and dirty stuff that the people actually, uh, you know, they want, you know, the gore and the, and the sleaze. So it's got, it, this season has a little bit of everything. And, the, and one of the many reasons why we love the show so much, I, I can attest it's the last drive in has broadened my horizons. Most definitely. Absolutely. A, a horror fan. Um, yeah. And, Cause and, you know, I look, I love nightmare on Elm street. I love Friday the 13th. I love all the major horror franchises, mm -hmm. but there's so much more to be discovered, especially in some of these obscure seventies and eighties movies. Yes. Um, that weren't necessarily like the top tier rentals. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like uh, so a movie that I'd love to see on the show is something like Burial Ground. Burial mm -hmm. Ground is such a great zombie movie, an Italian zombie movie, I think from 81. 
Um, so stuff like that, I hope, um, I hope the last drive in keeps going and then we can introduce people to movies like that. Um, and then of course, every once in a while, drop the thing that everybody's been asking for, like, uh, you know, uh, for Halloween three or something. You I never was, know. You I, never was, know. I, was, I was gonna say, where <laughs> Darcy's still holding her breath on that one. <laughs> She's holding her breath, but you never, never know. Well, uh, John, we, we really appreciate you coming on to Count Rahun's feature of Fright this evening. Uh, you've been an absolute joy. Uh, it's been an honor uh, to sit here with you to, uh, to, to talk about what you're doing and the last drive in and your career. Um, where can we go uh, to keep up with all things John P. Brennan? Uh, yeah, actually, you have it on your little uh, coffin board there at Bad Techno, either on Twitter or Instagram. And then in my bio, I have a, a link tree that you can find all my stuff or badtechno.com if you want to see some of the older origins of what I've become, uh, what I, what, ha what helped me become what I am today. And then it also has portals to some of the newer stuff like my band camp, uh, whatever. And so at bad techno or bad techno.com. Excellent. Well, once again, John, thank you so much for coming on to Count Rahun's feature fight and for what it's worth, you have a standing invitation. Anytime you want to come back, even if you don't have a specific project you want to talk about, if you just want to shoot the breeze about movies or music, Come right in. Abs Thank you, Count. Um, it's been an absolute honor to speak to an, a, real, a real Count and a real creature of the night. I've never met a vampire other than like, you know, people who suck your energy, like family members or shitty friends. Um, <laughs> but you, you're an actual bloodsucker, which I, I dig. Well, just, just think of it this way, John. You have now officially been interviewed by a vampire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that makes me the queen of the damned. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. John, thanks again. And thank you, Spooks and Spookettes, for joining us this evening. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. But be sure to join us next time for yet another feature of Fright. But until then, as far as things go, when things go bump in the night, there are such things... From ghoulies and ghosties. From ghoulies and ghosties. And long-leggedy beasties. And long-leggedy beasties. And, and things that, that go bump in the night. night. Good Lord! Deliver us! <laughs>